the Emperor would turn Skyrim into a puppet of the Dominion. Welcome, dear viewers, to Couch Warrior TV on YouTube. I am the Couch Warrior, and you are watching Aranus Arcana, a Skyrim Let's Play. Welcome to Chapter 9, Part 9. As you can see, the rest of the crew rode in. It is very early morning, and as planned, we have rendezvoused here at Robber's Gorge. Now from this point, we will be splitting the team yet again. This time, Lydia and Nefei will take the wagon and head back toward Whiterun, which will be our next rendezvous point. And Fleet and Valfar will be continuing on together to take care of some business. Now, we've inspected the letter of Gaius Morrow's schedule, and we have a little bit of time to kill. Fleet has elected to take out Gaius Morrow in the city of Whiterun, which gives us a few days to get there to plan our attack. And in that time, Fleet is going to use the convenience of his current location and the time that he has between now and when he has to actually carry out the assassination to make a side trip to Ustengrab. As you may recall, Ustengrab is actually the place we have been sent by the Greybeards to recover the Horn of Jurgen Windcaller as the final test of our ability and identity as the Dragonborn. <clears throat> and because this is a very specifically a dragonborn type mission, I have opted to take Valfar with me. Valfar really is drawn to Fleet, at least initially, because of the fact that Fleet is the Dragonborn. Valfar is probably one of the few people in Skyrim who really understands the significance of that. If you remember Valfar's background, he has spent 25 years on the mountain. He has learned some shouts. He knows about the voice. He knows the Greybeards well. And he knows the legend of the Dragonborn. And it was the realization that Fleet was the Dragonborn that caused Valfar to take upon himself this personal mission to be the bodyguard, the protector of the Dragonborn. He doesn't exactly know what it is the Dragonborn needs to do, needs to accomplish, but he knows that it's important, and he sees it as his place to stand for the Dragonborn and sort of be the protector, if you will. Fleet is very capable of taking care of himself, however, uh, Valfar can certainly be good bodyguard material, I would think. So he will be coming with us. So the intent here is that we are going to travel to Ustengrav, we are going to recover the horn of Jurgen Windcaller, and then we are going to continue on our way to Whiterun where we will meet up with the other members of our party and uh, make the next stage of our plan. There are a few reasons why Fleet has chosen to confront Gaius Morrow in Whiterun. Um, he's certainly not going to do it in Solitude because of um, the recent conflict that they had on the streets of Solitude with the Thalmor, and the assassination that he performed there. He's actually interested in getting as far away from Solitude as possible. But having looked at the itinerary, <clears throat> Gaius Morrow's next stop is actually Windhelm, and he is scheduled to spend time uh, in the Palace of Kings and then in the barracks. And the barracks are also in the Palace of Kings, heavily fortified, 
and completely stocked with storm cloaks. It's not an ideal situation in which to eliminate a target. So it's kind of a big hulking building with lots of guards, one way in, one way out, in a long trek from the front door to the front door of the city, the front gates of the city. So that one was not ideal. Now, the, the other location that he's going to be going to uh, following that would be Riften. Riften would have been actually a really great choice if Fleet were still hmm, maybe in a little bit better standing with the Thieves' Guild. At this point, Fleet doesn't really know where he stands with the Thieves' Guild. He knows that the, the two people who are considered leadership in the Thieves' Guild or significant individuals in the Thieves' Guild, he has essentially walked away from. So... At this point, he feels like he has more important things to do than to dote over his personal relationships with these people. So, in light of that, he has ruled out Riften. However, Riften would have been a great location. It would have been a place where, you know, he would have had some support structure and he would have been, you know, had some places to hide uh, and so forth. But that is really no longer an option given, cir given circumstances here. So... That brings us to Whiterun. Whiterun is a good location because, according to the itinerary, he is going to spend time at Dragon's Reach, and he is also going to be spending time at the Bannered Mare. It is a long walk for Gaius Morrow from Dragon's Reach to the Bannered Mare. And there are many, many opportunities over the course of that walk to eliminate a target. So it seems fairly wide open. The other motivation for selecting Whiterun as the location for this assassination is one of personal reasons. Fleet is still stinging a little bit from the betrayal of Balgruf, having called in the Thalmor and had him ambushed in the streets. The fact that, that Balgruf allowed that to happen and, and sort of um, maybe, maybe didn't necessarily order it, but allowed it to happen, right? Uh, Balgruf um, is ultimately in control there. So whether or not there are Thalmor walking the streets of Whiterun is entirely up to him. And so it's one of those deals where Fleet just feels as though Balgruf sort of decided to turn a blind eye after all he had done to help Balgruf with his dragon problem. So he is going to make a statement by killing this man in Balgruf City and causing a little controversy. Okay, that's Ustengrab over there. There. Okay, there's a... Whoa, what was that? That arrow glitched like crazy. Let's regroup a little bit here. Let's go to first person. I'm trying to get that mage. Here he comes. Oh, he's moving a lot. There he goes. All right. And all the bandits that were with him go down as well. So we cleared that out. We certainly can't leave our horses here. We're going to bring them closer to the barrow. Presumably in a, in a bit safer location. There are just too many spiders and chorus and crazy stuff out here. So we are going to find a suitable place to cross here. This is a fairly narrow spot. We'll let the horses swim it. I'll die before elves dictate the fate. All right, we made it. So I elected to take this side trip because I had the time to kill before Gaius Morrow arrived in Whiterun, and we were actually fairly close to Ustengrav already. And, you know, splitting the forces yet again, but with different combinations... Uh, of people is is only going to confuse the people who are hunting us even more. So 
when we have reclaimed our home. The objective here is that each and every time that they attempt to come after us or attempt to gather intelligence about us, they hear a different story. Uh, that's only going to help throw them off the trail, buy us time, until we can sort of make our plan. All right, let's go have a look. We should be able to acquire some good loot here, and I think, um, to be honest, Fleet is going to be just curi curious enough about his role in the world and this idea of being the Dragonborn that he would definitely want to pursue this. My hatred for the Empire is exceeded only by my hatred ah, for their witch elf puppet masters. Taking it. Not sure why, but I'm taking it. Honeycombs, we'll take that too. All right, Valfar. Mm -hmm. Let's do this. Let's do this thing. Fleet's Journal. The Dread Father comes to me nightly. A shadow cloaked in black flame, urging me ever onward, placing images in my mind, telling me where to go and what I must do. Burn it down. It has been months since I first wrote these words, but the visions have returned more vivid than ever. The air feels colder, and not in my gut, tighter. Something is going to happen, and it will be soon. My long sightedness, the gift, tells me this. I recognize now what I could not understand then. The feeling of change, the agent of chaos. This is the dread father at work. I can feel it. The awakening of darkness. Well, we've made it inside Ustengrav. We encountered a couple mages here. They seem to be fighting with their own minions. They're falling to ash, so they must be undead or zombies they've raised to do work for them or something. Similar to what we encountered outside. So we'll have to exercise some caution. Barrows full of mages. We do not like. But nothing we can't handle. Got Valfar with us. Something tells me he's a mage killer. What's in here? Ooh. Fly Amanita. I love saying Amanita. So what should we talk about, brothers and sisters? Should we talk a little bit about role play? Why not? A lot of you are asking me questions about this, and I get a lot of comments from people who are telling me, hey, Couch Warrior, thanks. You've inspired me to try you know, a new character type or a different style of play or to you know, create a background. I've actually had a couple people send me their character bios and um, background stories and stuff, which has been really interesting. So we talked a little bit previously about character versus characterization. And all I really did was very briefly define what those are in, in a character sense. But there are other elements that, that really help a lot in roleplay. One of the things we talk about a lot... Oh, we got a battle coming up. Let's press pause for a minute. Okay. I tend to eliminate the mages before the Draugr. The Draugr seem to be a little bit easier to outsmart. Okay, maybe we'll let these guys kill each other and stay out of it. Oh yeah, look at that mess. We're not getting into that mess. 
so getting at the difference between between character and characterization, you could sort of view characterization as the physical, the outward elements that make up a character. The character's mask, if you will. But the actual character is revealed slowly over time through their actions, right? And their actions should support their motivations, right? So if, if a character is has a particular motivation, um, their actions should reflect them taking actions in pursuit of those motivations. So one of the things that you should think about, and, and that I do often, is understanding what the character's motivation is. And that's really the reason that we would craft something like a character bio or a background, right? Because uh, all of us are kind of the, the sum total of our experiences and other things. Um, people are complex. There's no doubt about it. Um, anybody who thinks that you can predict what a person is going to do slow, solely based on their background is sorely mistaken. Um, it, it takes, uh, I think, a lot more um, a lot more insight than just that. If it were that simple, then wow, things would be a lot easier around here. It's a fight you okay, you two Draugr. We gotta help him out here. We're gonna keep this Draugr off his back. Sort of. Wow. He's taking a lot of shots. Four shots. Come on, Velfar. Stand in there. Come on, buddy. Let's finish him off. What are we waiting for? Damn. He's hardcore. So, true character is choices under pressure. A character is validated by his actions. So, what about motivations? Well, I talked about that just a little bit there. Um, getting your character's motivations down is one of those things that you can put in a character's background or a character's bio. So, what does your character want and why does he or she want it? That's really the most basic thing you need to understand. Um, so, you know, we need to have a solid understanding of our character's motive. Um, I understand what Fleet's motives are, what his motivation is. I feel like uh, my understanding is, is fairly solid right now, given I'm crafting the story. That would make sense, right? But what I'm choosing to reveal to you is somewhat limited, and there are things that I don't even know quite yet um, about Fleet, how he would react in certain situations because we haven't encountered them, right? Um, so I think there's this element of mystery. And so one of the things I would encourage you to do as a role player is go ahead, come up with some motivations, come up with a bio, but don't be so stringent in your uh, pursuit of those motivations that you exclude yourself from doing other fun things because you feel like you need to stay in character. The essence of character is, is change, and that brings us to character dimension. This is where things get a bit more existential, right? Um, you hear people talk a lot about three-dimensional characters. Oh, this character's awesome because he's three-dimensional, um, or a rounded character as opposed to a flat. A flat character would be um, a character who is really just a collection of traits, right? Um, this character is good with a long sword, and he is highly educated, and he likes skooma. Those are traits. Um, and traits alone make for boring characters. Um, you could actually chalk up traits as some of the elements that you might consider under characterization, right? So, you know, think, let's think beyond simply character traits and let's think about true dimension. And true dimension uh, are not really traits at all, but they're more, oh, you could, you, could, uh, you could actually borrow from our psychological profile when you think about it. Um, 
what makes a character interesting or what gives a character true dimension is much, much more than just a collection of traits. For example, what I, what I tend to look at is different dichotomies in a character, right? What, what are the ways in which they contradict themselves? Because we all do that. Um, because it's those contradictions, it's in those contradictions that we find dimension, that we find complexity. The way that I view dimension is complexity. The simplest example I can, I can think of off the top of my head is the charming thief, right? Those two traits, those two things, uh, you know, somebody who is charming and somebody who will, you know, steal the wallet from your pocket are two sort of diametrically opposed things. But when you place them together, you get sort of a really interesting uh, sort of, I don't know, visual and emotional impression of what this character is like. So what are, what are those dimensions for your character? You know, think about them. And they can be numerous. Um, they can be very, very numerous. Um, that's what makes us human is our complexity. So think about, you know, things that are sort of diametrically opposed to one another and how they would apply to your character. Not that you need to apply these specific attributes, but think about attributes like this and whether or not they apply and why. So here are some examples you could consider. Uh, cruelty versus compassion. We're not saying that a character is going to be one and not the other. We're saying that a character with dimension is both. So think about how does that manifest itself, right? Um, spiritual versus blasphemous. I think that you could say that Fleet is both spiritual and blasphemous, right? He has said some very awful things about people of the cloth, about the Daedra, about the Aedra. However, he, he is more spiritually devout than most of the people around him and most of the people he will probably encounter in Skyrim. So that is the kind of dichotomy I'm talking about, right? Um, courageous and cowardly. I think you could easily say that this applies to Fleet as well. Uh, there are many times when he has done absolutely courageous things, but at the same time, he has some traits that outwardly might appear to be cowardly. Well, there's a difference between cowardly and smart in a field of battle, but he tends to hang back. He uses his bow. He likes to stay out of arm's reach of his opponents unless he's confident he has the upper hand. That could be construed as, as cowardice, or it could just be construed as street smarts. Right? But it's how these things play off each other that give our character dimension. Uh, somebody who's ruthless and compassionate at the same time. I think that applies to Fleet, right? And how does that manifest itself? Well, he goes around assassinating people. What could be more ruthless than that? But he's compassionate enough that he, he gives money to beggars. He leaves donations at the orphanage. Um, what else have we seen him do that was compassionate? actually quite a few things, right? So he sees a, an urchin on the street selling flowers and he buys all of her flowers. He leaves um, food for Aventus Aretino when he could have just left the kid alone. So it's things like that. Um, here's another example. Lucid versus confused, right? Again, this is another trait that you could apply to Fleet. He's a complex person. He's got lots of issues going on. He's got lots of things he's confused about, right? But when it comes to planning, when it comes to killing, when it comes to plotting, he is extremely lucid, extremely intelligent, right? But when it comes to his own personal feelings about where he fits in in the world, he's very confused. Uh, a person can be both sane and mad. A person can be both cool and compulsive and rash. So... These are the things that you want to think about that could give your character real, true dimension, right? No flat characters. We don't like flat characters. So, something to consider, brothers and sisters. Now, we've got some Draugr and some Skeletons and some other nasties to take care of. 
thank you for letting me take that little departure. I hope some of this information helps. If, if there's anything you have questions about, anything you want me to review, anything uh, you want to just bounce off me, I'm, I'm happy to be a sounding board for some of your ideas. I think we're all in this for the same reason. We're all interested in having a great time with this game. And this game, in my view, is so rich in content and experiences that it's almost a shame not to bring in this kind of role play and really experience everything that Skyrim has to offer uh, to its fullest. So feel free. Uh, you can send me tweets. Couch Warrior TV. That's at Couch Warrior TV. You can go to my Tumblr site at uh, couchwarrior.tv. Uh, there is a form there where you can submit things. You can send me uh, private messages on YouTube. I also have a Gmail address out there. Uh, if, if we want to do a more lengthy communication about any of that stuff, um, I'm happy to provide that as well. So feel free to contact me. And uh, if there's anything else that you'd actually prefer that I address in this format during the Let's Play having to do with uh, building character and role play and maybe just some little tools that you can use to help you out as you start to craft um, these characters that you're you're going to immerse yourself in uh, certainly let me know I can cover those topics as well I'm happy to do that okay so where are we at we are not yet thoroughly lost in Ustengrav Just trying to make sure I don't miss anything here. Eh, little gold. Just looking around. Lots of potions. Lots of health potions. You can sort of tell that this uh, level was designed for lower level characters. Not a lot of loot to be had. Actually, the bit of loot that I'm most excited about so far I found outside in that in that chest just at the entrance was a uh, ebony war axe. I don't know why I'd be excited about that. I just think, you know, that might be something that one of our followers might look really good wielding at some point. So... I'm, I've never been a huge fan of the ebony armor so much, but the ebony weapons, wow, I love the ebony weapons. I just love the look of them, kind of the ornate qualities. Here's that guy we took out through that little opening. The only exception, I would say, is the ebony mail. I do love the ebony mail. I love the uh, magical effects on it, and there's just enough variation there that it's kind of interesting. All right, we are descending deeper into the abyss that is Ustengrav. All right, we got oil. That will probably come in handy. All right, let's see if we can open this. That only opens one gate. So there is another switch conveniently located next to this crypt. And there it is. Okay, we are going to let Valfar take one of them. We'll take the other one. We'll take advantage of this napalm. Oh, he's going to run right through it. Take him out. There we go. I think we finished him off, although... I didn't hear the uh, resounding thunk that comes with a kill shot, typically. He's on fire. How far could he go, really? Okay. He was running away from us. That's what matters at this point. Away. Mostly good stuff. I'll take this dagger. 
sell it to somebody. Is he going to block my way? Squeeze through. There we go. The guy is such a hulk, you know? That's the problem I, I have with uh, using him as a companion in confined spaces like this, is he has a, a tendency to block doorways with his size. Where did this other guy go? Well, there he is right there. He didn't get too far. And some poison. Not much else going on up here. So Fleet is intensely interested in what it means to be Dragonborn. This is an aspect of his life that he hadn't expected. Just when he thinks he has everything mapped out and he knows what his path is and he thinks he understands who he is and his place in the world, somebody throws a curveball. And the Dragonborn deal is a really big curveball. So at this point, he's interested in completing as much of the training as he can with the Greybeards. Here, look at these guys. There's one of them. Another one. Another one. Who else? It can't be all of them. Oh, here we go. Charge me. This makes my job easy. So he is willing to lose sleep and work overtime in order to squeeze in this little job in between the things that he's got to do for the Dark Brotherhood, just because it has to do with his, his personal life, who he is. It's going to unlock some mystery, he hopes, about what he's supposed to do with his life and the kind of person that he is supposed to be. Okay, dear viewers, there is a chest back there in this little alcove. I've never been able to figure out how the hell to get in there. Please post in the comments. Thank you. So, oh, this guy looks like... Yeah, he's a jumper. Not anymore. Okay. I think we got this place cleaned out. At least this part. So Fleet is kind of in this position where, you know, any time he gets some insight into the path ahead, whether it be spiritual or otherwise um, associated with Sithis or the Dragonborn or being the Listener or whatever, he's going to grab onto it with both hands and do everything he can to try to, you know figure out what it all means. This has pretty much been his M.O. for a long time. Um, and, and this actually plays into that whole thing we were talking about with you know, being a bit confused. Right? He's, he's a bit confused. Frankly, there's an awful lot to be confused about. So, it's almost like you could say that in this instance, as he enters Ustengrav, he enters Ustengrav in almost a childlike manner, right? Whereas when he was outside Ustengrav, he was all business and he was about the assassination mission and the plotting and all that stuff. Now he's in Ustengrav and he's in here purely in pursuit of something having to do with him personally. Um, and so he enters Ustengrav with a sense of excitement, anticipation, trepidation. Here we have the wall. Ah, become ethereal. You will notice that Fleet is also a light with the magical fire that alerts him when a word wall is nearby. OK. 
Okay. Yeah, I'm going to stay dry as long as we can, but I think that's over now. So let's get down in here and see what we can find. Hmm. Maybe we should play this one a little bit differently. Put the bow away for a spell. Ha, <laughs> I said spell. No, that was funny. Didn't really mean it that way, but you know what I mean. Okay. Never tried uh, bending the shadows on a draugr. But let's give it a shot and see what happens. We're getting a few licks in. This is interesting. I never had really, um, until a couple episodes ago, I had never really considered the combat potential of this spell. I had always thought of it as really just an assassination tool, but in combat, it's proven to be extremely effective. Extremely effective. I like that. Two episodes ago, there was a big battle between uh, Fleet and the Dark Fist and the Thalmor. Uh, the opening sequence, it was just Fleet fighting some Thalmor soldiers. And one of the things I noticed was how when I used this spell, it was so disorienting for my opponents that each time I changed positions, they would actually sheathe their bound weapons. They were so confused about where I was, they thought I was just gone. So they'd put their weapons away. And in the split second, it took them to recast their bound sword spells, I was able to get in one or two shots um, if I was doing well. There were a couple of cases there where I was swinging too early and I wasn't charging, but that's neither here nor there, right? The fact is that if an enemy puts away his weapon and draws it again, that's a significant amount of time. If we can't get in a power attack or at least two good shots during that time, uh, there's something really wrong. So it's proven to be very effective um, in, in standard melee combat situations. So I will be using it frequently going forward. For those of you who are interested, at the suggestion of more than one of my dear viewers, I have finally started using Immersive HUD by Gopher. And I am enjoying it. You may notice that you're not seeing a bunch of markers and a lot of stuff here. Um, I still haven't fully configured it yet. I'm still working on that a little bit. But as it is now, I believe I have it set up so that when my weapon is drawn, I have a crosshair. Otherwise, the crosshair should go away. At least, that's the plan. Um, there are actually more settings in there than I expected, and I haven't really played with them too much. I've got sort of a baseline established here, and I'm just going to test this and see how I like it. But uh, thank you, dear viewers, for that suggestion. You are saving me uh, probably a crap ton of hassle having to change my display settings uh, between scenes all the time and stuff like that. So this ought to be pretty nice. Thank you very much, viewers, and thank you, Gopher. All right. We know there's a nasty guy up here. Yeah, there he is. We're going to let Valfar take this guy. I'm sure he's more than capable of handling that business. And we're going to go for the gold, so to speak. All right. So, give me some loot here. So, this episode is going to come in at almost an hour long, about 55, 56 minutes in total. Um, I had reservations, as you know, when I first started this Let's Play, I had reservations about doing any episodes that were over 30 minutes. I'm not sure why I had those reservations. The research that I have done based on the 75 episodes we've done thus far uh, would indicate 
that you guys have an incredible stamina for long episodes. In fact, the longest episode that I ever made was over an hour, and I got I've I've got probably more views on that uh, than any of my other more current episodes. So, very nice. In other words, I guess what I'm saying is I'm not going to be shy about producing episodes that are a bit longer now. Um, I tend to, you know, try to divide them up where I think the seams should naturally occur. Oh, man, I didn't make it. I didn't make it. Too slow. Let's try it again. Battle reveals who a man really is. Remember that. Yeah. I think this job was easier for me on a controller. Come on. Now. Wow. Oh, I thought I had it that time. Third time is the charm, ladies and gentlemen. That is what they say. And I tend to believe that. Okay, here we go. Countless air, yeah. haunt countless sleepless nights. Okay, sky we'll sprint, and again. then we're going to hit Perhaps whirlwind sprint. Here it is, now. There we go. Jeez. That gave me a little trouble. Okay. These pressure plates are not really a problem for me. I'm a little bit concerned about Valfar, though, however. So I'm going to try to break a trail for him. Hopefully he'll follow close. And he can stay out of the fire himself. However, before I do that, I seem to recall... Let's see. A lot of spider webs, so we're going to keep our eyes on the ceilings. Yep, yeah, you can hear him up there. Come on, there he is. Did I hit him? Try to get him out in the open. Okay, here we go. Let's give ourselves a little bit more maneuver maneuverability. No room to maneuver? Ooh. Okay. Alright, we're gonna jump across to this rock just opposite the platform here. There we go. And try to hug the walls. Okay, now from this position another spider be able to take him out. There we go. Is there another one? Yes, there is. Look at that. Very nice. Okay, now we got a short hop across here. Another little bit of rock to stand on. And my hope is Valfar is just going to follow me here, but I don't know if he's going to do that or not. Alright, look at that. Big mother hanging up there. Let's take her out before she has a chance to give us a problem. There she comes. What a mess. Take our venom. Look at that. He did follow me. We will take our venom and our spider eggs. Spider eggs, of course, I use heavily for fortify marksman potions. We'll cut our way through this. Now, it's worth mentioning, ladies and gentlemen, that we are approaching the end of Chapter 9. Yes, I know. Very close to the end of Chapter 9. I won't tell you how close we are. But not only that, we are also rapidly approaching 
the end of Act Damn Two. Faithless Imperials. So what By the nine, I is in the store waiting. for us? The goddamn waiting. I have some ideas about how the story is turning. I've got lots of ideas that are sort of long-range plans, and also some so some uh, shorter, some shorter-range plans. And you know what? I'm going to talk about those. I think in the next episode, I've got some additional things I want to say about character then too, and these things will play on one another. Ooh, look at this. Now I asked Valfar to wait behind because I don't know what we're going to encounter in here, so he shall wait. Thank you.